that's joined us so far. We're just going to wait a couple of minutes uh, just to make sure we were expecting about 65 attendees and the rate of attendance is not raising, uh, increasing dramatically at the moment. Um, David and Trev, can you just confirm that you can hear me? Yep. Yep, great. We can yes. hear you. That's good. I'm not talking to myself. All right, so everybody, welcome to MUARC Insights' first webinar. I'm Karen Stephan. I'll be chairing the session today with the assistance of Trevor Allen. Today, we will hear from MUARC Senior Research Fellow, Dr. David Logan, about addressing outer urban road safety in metropolitan Melbourne. David will present for about 45 minutes, after which we'll have time for questions. Please post your questions in the Q&A section, and Trevor and, I, Trevor and I will relay them to David after he has finished presenting. We'll be finishing just before 11 in time for anyone that wants to observe Remembrance Day. Uh, if we don't have enough time to get through all the questions, then we will um, pose them to David and he can uh, reply uh, on a group email to all the attendees. So David, um, away, up, off you go, uh, over to you. Thanks, Karen. Welcome everyone. Um, this project was initiated by the MUARC Baseline Program sponsors, the Department of Transport, formerly VicRose, the TAC, and the Department of Justice and Community Services. It's a few years ago now, it was around 2013, the project was initiated. Um, and it was in response to emerging road safety concerns about the rapidly growing outer suburbs of Melbourne. Now it is, um, it is quite a, um, a Victorian centric and I suppose Melbourne centric project in a way, but I think there's probably some, some lessons in there for other areas um, around Australia where there are rapidly growing outer fringes of, um, of many of the large cities. But Melbourne's characterized by, a, by its very flat landscape and we've got a lot, our urban sprawl is, um, has, has become um, um, quite ridiculous in the last few years because there's really no geographical constraints to, um, to, to growth and, and no, um, no disincentives from, um, from growth in um, um, geographically either. And Melbourne's now one of the largest cities by area in the world, despite our um, relatively modest population. The project had four phases, and the first of these was to develop a, a definition of outer urban areas. We, we sort of had a feel for what they were, but we needed to understand what, what, how we could define that in a more um, objective way. And then, of course, we needed to understand the nature of the of fatal and serious injury road trauma and to identify the key problems associated with outer urban areas compared with those in the, in the inner metro or metro Melbourne. The third phase was to examine planned outer urban road safety investment and how it aligned with these problems. And finally, we modelled the benefits of a selection of effective road safety initiatives that we hope um, have the potential, if implemented, mm -hmm. to, um, to improve road safety in these regions in the future. To categorise the outer urban areas, we use the remoteness areas of Australia, and it divides Australia into, into five class, classes of remoteness on the basis of a measure of relative access to services. The classification structure is, was developed by the um, uh, Institute in Adelaide and it's now been um, adopted by the ABS. And it's intended for the purpose of analyzing statistical data to inform research and policy development in Australia. But we've been using it for, to subdivide Australia for strategy and development, for strategy development and modeling purposes with great success for, um, for, for many years now. The score was developed for much smaller geographical units, but we used LGA since the crash data is very is much more easily categorised at this level. The five regions are assigned scores. The maximum score is 15 and the minimum is zero. Under the standard classification, it ranges from major cities have a score of less than 0.2 out to very remote, which is greater than 10.53. Victoria doesn't have any remote or very remote areas at LGA level. You'll see from the map there that there's a couple of um, pale green sections right there in the in the Mallee region, but it's actually, and when you when you conglomerate it by LGA, they um, average out to being outer regional. So what we did to define an outer urban area is we proposed some new categories. We assigned Metro as being a score of zero. Outer Metro, we nominated as being between 0 0.01 and 0 0.5, inner regional between 0 0.5 and 2.4, and outer regional as before. But we noticed at the time we were using the, the ARIA plus classifications, which is the remoteness classifications from 2006. And we observed since that time that um, under this proposed classification, some of the, some of the, the, the suburbs and the LGAs were being um, um, miscategorized. They were being classed as, as inner regional and they were clearly um, much more of the nature of outer urban. So what we did is we had a look at some supplementary measures, um, those four that are listed there, population growth, 
the growth in the total number of mortgaged and owned homes, total number of businesses employing people and the total registered motor vehicles of all types. And it's pretty obvious from, the, from those, um, those charts of the growth between 2006 and 2000, um, or the growth from the period 2006, 2007 to 2011, that the characteristics of the metro areas and the, the outer metro and inner regional and outer regional are all quite different. And you can see the second set of bars there represents the outer metro areas. And the growth in those areas has been much greater than that, even in metro areas and, um, and much greater definitely than, than inner and outer regional areas. And over that time period that we were looking at, you can see there's even negative growth in businesses in inner and outer regional areas. And this is obviously likely to have changed in the last year or two with the pandemic and people um, migrating to the, to the inner regional areas. And we all might see how that um, pans out in, in a few years time. So this is the final list of LGAs that, that were classified as uh, outer urban areas. Everything else on the, every other LGA uh, on that map without the red dot are uh, a metro areas, except for, I think it's, um, I don't know whether you can see my cursor, but there's um, Nilambic, Yarra Ranges and Mornington Peninsula. They're classes in a regional based on the, the categorization system that we developed. So they're showing, they show less growth um, than, the, than either the, than the outer urban areas. And we, we decided that even though in Mornington Peninsula, you could argue is, is potentially an outer urban suburb, but it doesn't have that same rate of growth that places like Casey, Cardinia, uh, Wyndham and Melton do. We looked at fatal and serious crashes. That was the focus of the, the investigation between 2008 and 2012. Nearly 68,500 crashes in total, uh, police reported crashes from crash stats, of which there were nearly 26,000 fatal and serious injury crashes and about 30,460 fatal and serious injuries among those uh, 25,500 crashes. In addition to the, the standard crash stats um, data, we, data that was received, we also had um, latitude and longitude ge geocoded for each, each crash. We had the remoteness region of the crash location, which we assigned based on the LGA of the crash. And we also had the centroid of the postcode of residence for the person involved in the crash as well. And this uh, allowed us to draw a couple of um, interesting conclusions, which I'll, um, I'll show you a little bit later on. This is a nice little map showing the distribution of all of the FSI over that particular period, over the five-year period from 2008. The red dots are the outer metro crashes. Uh, there's a couple of there's a couple of little a uh, couple of false positives here and there. There's a few that are that are coming up red that should really be purple for the inner regional areas, but you can see how the the crashes are concentrated around those um, two major southeast and the northwest areas of Melbourne and the west. So let's look now at some of the the statistics. Uh, the, the, well, well, we started out by doing a um, just a descriptive analysis of the data, just to get a feel for the the um, what it was telling us. These are the overall casualty rates per hundred thousand population. On the left are fatalities. The first column is for Victoria overall, and at the time that was around about five point four per hundred thousand fatalities. And there's, a, there's quite a progression from inner metro through to outer regional. And, and I think what this really starkly um, tells us, apart from um, the fact that outer metro is, um, is about 2.3 times higher fatality rate than, than the rest of the metro areas, inner regional and outer regional are, are many times higher. And this is, this is characteristic of, of all, all inner and outer regional areas around Australia. They, they're much higher fatality rates and to a lesser extent serious injury rates than, than there are in, um, in metro areas. And this, is, this really says that I think, um, before without getting distracted by this topic, that the, um, that the regional areas are one where we really should be focusing a lot, of, um, a lot of our road safety efforts, particularly with regard to fatalities. With serious injury, you see a similar sort of pattern. Um, outer metro serious injury rates are about 40% higher than metro areas. And inner regional and outer regional are, um, are stepping up again from that. Road user age and gender was quite interesting. In, we've got outer metro is this left-hand grid and inner metro on the right-hand side. I'll highlight the main points for you. The, the, the 10 to 19 year age group has some, um, is overrepresented by about 74%. Um, that's about one and three quarter times as many 
um, 10 to 19 year olds in, are, um, are fatally or seriously injured in outer metro areas versus metro areas. This is numbers rather than rates. And the 70 plus year olds are about 45% down. Among that, sorry, among that 10 to 19 year old age group, the 16 to 17 year olds are about 88% overrepresented. They comprise 3.3% of outer metro FSI compared to only 1.8% in the, in the metro areas. And that's partly, I think, due to a younger population, but this, it also maybe reflects the higher risk of driving in those areas. The 18 to 21 year olds are 47% higher, 16.5% versus 11% in metro areas. So some interesting characteristics of, um, of a younger, younger involved population for fatal and serious injury. Looking at crash type now, probably the most distinctive characteristic here is that pedestrians and bicyclists are heavily underrepresented. And this is likely to be driven by exposure in particular, because I think, um, I think we know in particular for bicyclists that, that outer urban areas are probably less safe with higher speed limits and, um, and, and fewer bicycle facilities and the same with pedestrians as well. It's probably a lower, lower rate of walking because of the, the absence of public transport services or the, the relative lack of public transport services in outer metro areas. But nevertheless, what it, what it means is that drivers and passengers are overrepresented proportionally amongst fatal and serious injuries in outer metro areas compared with metro. And it's interesting all, also to note that there's some, there's a few trends as you go across uh, pedestrians are steadily less represented as you go to more uh, inner regional than outer regional areas and the same as bicyclists, which you'd expect. And you do notice this progression mostly from metro through outer metro than inner regional and outer regional. There's always a trend either one way or the other, depending upon the characteristic that we're looking at. This is probably shown up. Um, this is now looking at um, IES vehicle type or crash type. Single vehicle crashes are much more prevalent in outer, outer metro areas. Um, they comprise about a third of all outer metro F, uh, FSI compared to only a fifth in metro areas. Vehicle to vehicle crashes are 11% uh, um, lower in um, outer metro compared with metro and pedestrian crashes are 45% lower. Of course, that's similar to the previous. And also of note, but, um, but it's, it's still a small absolute numbers, but rollover crashes are three times more common in outer metro areas compared with metro. 4.5% of outer metro FSI are rollover compared to 1.5% in metro areas. And, and you can see there from the, from the table that in outer regional areas, almost one in seven crashes is a, is a rollover crash. And I'm, I'm, I'm highlighting these because a rollover is a particularly severe crash type. Speed zone is an interesting one. Crashes in um, sub 40 kilometer an hour zones or 40 kilometers an hour and below are about 61% um, underrepresented in outer metro compared with metro. 50 kilometers an hour and 60 kilometers an hour are also down, but 70 to 90 zones, um, and we don't have too many um, 90 zones or 75 zones anymore, but they're 74% overrepresented. An interesting thing to, to highlight from this table are the 80 kilometer an hour zones. 80 kilometer an hour zones comprise 12% of metro FSI, but they're 23, nearly 23 and a half percent, nearly a quarter of all outer metro FSI are in 80 kilometer an hour speed zones. And that's higher than any of the other regional classifications, 12.3% in inner regional and six and a half percent in outer. So what this is most likely telling us is that there is most likely an overrepresentation of 80 kilometer an hour speed zones, but also um, they're obviously more severe for vehicle occupants as well. And so you tend to have higher FSI levels. And as you would expect, just finally, 100 kilometer an hour speed zones and above are six times overrepresented in, in outer metro compared to metro. That's a, a fairly obvious finding because there's way more 100 kilometer an hour zones in those areas. Looking at time of day, this is just, um, just one of interest really, it doesn't necessarily um, impinge on anything that we're going to conclude, but you notice in the, in the outer metro areas, which, are the, which is the red trace, the morning peak of FSI anyway, um, occurs earlier than what it does. It's in the hours from, the hours from six to seven when the most number of FSI happen in outer metro areas compared to the, the hours between eight and nine in, in metro, but it's also a much shorter peak. The, the metro um, starts to rise at about seven o'clock 
and there's a, there's a peak that runs right through till almost 10 to 11. Whereas the, the, the outer metro areas, it drops away much more quickly. And this, I'd conclude from this, that it's, it seems as though a lot of people who live in outer metro areas are probably commuting um, longer distances. And so therefore they're leaving earlier in order to get to their place of work. And that results in that spike um, at an earlier hour than what it does in the metro areas. Similar trends for the afternoon peak, both start to come up around three o'clock in the afternoon. But in outer metro areas, that peak lasts right through until the hours between the hour between six and seven. Whereas in metro areas, it starts to drop away between five and six, not to as great an extent as what it rises in the morning, but it's, a, it's still an interesting trend. By day of week also, there's not too much to note there, but Thursdays and Fridays are the worst, uh, the, the worst days for FSI in metro areas, about 13% worse than you would expect if it was evenly distributed across the week. But Thursday to Saturday is worst in outer metro areas. There's a lot more activity on a Saturday leading to um, higher FSI proportionally than on a, on a Saturday compared to metro areas. And finally, this is an interesting one. This is um, uh, one that we tried to do looking at distance from home between the crash and the centroid of the residential postcode. So this represents uh, the proportion of FSI by straight line distance between the crash location and the centroid of the postcode where the person um, stated they resided. So obviously distances over the ground are going to be maybe 25 to 30% longer than that. But it's just interesting to note that in metro areas, over half of all FSI occur within 10 kilometres of the person's home residence. In outer metro areas, it's about the same, it's about 50%. But interestingly, and I, I think um, this is one that I've, I've had a number of discussions with um, MPs in, at, at Senate, um, estimate, Senate committee hearings, that they always say that it's the, um, it's the tourists coming into the regional areas that cause most of the crashes. But you can see that um, in inner regional areas, 46% or thereabouts of um, FSI occur within 20 kilometres of the residential um, home of the, of the crash victim. So even in, even in regional areas, 40, nearly half the FSI are probably, probably to locals or people from um, also from within the inner regional areas. So I think that sort of maybe debunks the myth that, um, that it's always the tourists that are crashing in, um, in country Victoria. So that was the descriptive analysis. Um, what we needed to do then was um, to try and identify um, the real differentiating crash factors between the outer metro and metro areas. So we wanted to investigate the magnitude and the statistical significance of the difference between them. We used the 2008 to 2012 Victorian police reported crash data again, and we identified the inner and outer urban area crashes using the, um, the, the same categorizations, obviously, as in the descriptive analysis. The logistic regression analysis, uh, the outcome variable was the was outer versus inner Melbourne or, or the rest of um, Metro Melbourne. We ran separate models for all casualties and serious casualty models. And we included uh, multivariate crash factors and we, we looked at all the interactions um, between, the, um, between the different variables as well and used a stepwise procedure to identify the significant main effects and the first order interactions. These are the factors considered. Um, I won't go through these in detail. Um, the only thing that might be worth noting is that we also looked at vehicle age. We looked at older vehicles of 15 years and above and vehicles aged under three years to see if there's any correlation between that and, and FSI rates. Vehicle types, including SUV, like commercial, heavy and motorcycle were also included. We grouped the, the crash type into these DCA groups rather than looking at them um, at specific uh, crash types. These are the crash factors that are more likely in outer urban areas. Amongst all casualty crashes, we noted, um, as, as was um, strongly hinted at by the descriptive analysis, 81 to 110 kilometre an hour speed zones were, were much more likely in outer metro compared to metro, particularly on highways. Mid-block crashes were also overrepresented. Um, I imagine those would be primarily run off road. Crashes occurring at non signalized intersections rather than signalized, particularly in the higher speed zones. Crashes on freeways, on local roads, and once again, particularly at unsignalized intersections. Curved and undivided roads were also overrepresented compared to metro areas, and also older drivers, um, drivers aged 64 years and over on main and local roads, were more likely to occur in outer metro areas compared to metro areas. 
In addition to these, for the, the serious casualty crash analysis, drivers aged from 55 to 64 years were also overrepresented, and drivers aged 64 plus years during weekdays, both daytime and nighttime. Those crash factors that were less likely to occur in outer urban areas were for all casualty crashes, the lower speed zones, 60 to 75 kilometre an hour speed zones, particularly on highways in the 50 kilometres an hour and below at signalised intersections, crashes on highways um, at mid block and, and in the lower speed zones on highways and on unsignalised intersections on main roads. It's compared to the, the local roads that we we're talking about uh, for the overrepresentation. Divided straight roads were less likely to, um, to experience FSIs compared to inner metro areas and motorcycle, bicycle and pedestrian involved crashes were also less likely to occur in outer metro compared to metro. Serious casualty crashes uh, were less likely to occur on, on divided straight highways and also off path FSI crashes on main roads were less likely and crashes involving drivers aged over 64 on weekends, which is an interesting one. Now, the next phase of the project was to look at the alignment between the road safety strategies that are in place. Um, and these are at um, both national, uh, state and, and local level. We wanted to see whether the crash problems that we'd observed um, from both the descriptive analysis and the, the logistic regression analysis were properly targeting the, um, the, the issues, or being properly targeted by the, by the strategy, sorry. So to do this, we, we looked at the crash prevalence data and we reviewed that against the available road safety strategy and action plans from federal, state and local government sources. And that's a summary there on screen of the, of the documents that were some of the documents that were summarized. And we use the results of this analysis to infer whether future investment in road trauma in outer urban Melbourne is going to be likely adequate to achieve the objectives of the Victorian road safety strategy. And adding to this, if we, if we found a, a discrepancy or a shortfall between the, the, the problems and the, the strategies and action plans that were designed to tackle those problems, we wanted to identify the magnitude of additional or redistributed road safety investment that might be required in outer urban areas to meet strategy targets. Looking first at infrastructure and speed factors, um, these are the crash-based factors identified as being significantly overrepresented in outer urban areas, um, and that most of them featured strongly when ranked by crash prevalence. These included casualty crashes on local roads, divided roads, excluding same direction and off-path crashes, and also the higher speed zones. The desktop review identified that all of these parameters were included uh, as a focus in the current national and Victorian strategies. And about half of the local government strategy documents address the key issues in, in one way or another. Most of the strategies targeting crash-based parameters are, up, are going to be infrastructure-based, so it's, it's probably not surprising that the strategies by LGAs showed less focus on infrastructure, given that national and state governments have the greatest responsibility in this area. The highest speed zones, which are ranked third in priority overall, and, and you can see that the odds ratios are, are, are extremely high for these, um, this category of, of this factor as well, which means they're, they're much more likely to occur in the, in the outer metro areas. They have the potential to realise significant benefits through reviews of speed limit zones and also subsequent reductions in speed and increased speed enforcement. And I think we can, um, it, it's pretty obvious at this point that the, that the 80 kilometre an hour speed zones are a particular focus of this. Among the driver and vehicle and road user factors, two of the driver and vehicle based parameters were identified as being significantly overrepresented. They ranked four and five. And these were large vehicles, um, that's SUVs and utilities driven by males and small vehicles driven by females, uh, both compared with medium sized vehicles is, the, is what the odds ratio refers to. There was no specific focus on these factors, however, at national Victorian or LGA levels. However, there are a number of broader proposed initiatives that may indirectly reduce FSI in outer urban areas relating to these factors. 
And these include things like vehicle-based strategies, such as awareness programs, promoting purchase of safer vehicles, or national and state level support for the development of safer vehicle technologies. Newer vehicles were significantly less likely to be involved in FSI crashes in outer urban areas, suggesting that there are potential benefits to be gained from shifting to a younger and uh, safer vehicle fleet, particularly for SUVs, utilities, and small passenger vehicles. And at least partly due to the lesser prevalence of pedestrians and cyclists in the crash data, vehicle oc occupants were overrepresented among fatalities. And the, the current, or well, at the time current, and I'm not sure the, um, uh, whether this, the, the, the newer Victorian strategy addresses this either, but neither at the, the national or Victorian level strategies at the time contained a specific focus on reducing serious injury to this, to the, this very large group of vehicle occupants. However, a number of general speed related, road user related and infrastructure based national and Victorian strategies are likely to lead to reductions in outer urban areas without them being targeted specifically. These include roadside barrier treatments on arterial roads and reductions in, um, in speed zones. Several, several of the LGAs included broader vehicle based strategies improved at, uh, aimed at improving the safety of the vehicle fleet or vehicle occupants. But these are mostly related to, as is obviously um, um, what's possible with in, um, in an LGA, education related activities, um, including things like safer installation of child restraints. But I think it was encouraging that the three to four of the, the LGAs at least address this issue in their, their local strategies. Just to summarize the, the investment targeting analysis, there were five areas of action and intervention with the, the greatest benefit for addressing fatality and serious injuries in outer metro areas. Probably a very high priority among those are the, the first two, a focus on investment in local road infrastructure. Local roads often comprise a, a, a large part of the road network by length, but they, they probably have quite a, quite a distributed crash problem. So it is, it is difficult to target infrastructure at local roads but maybe it's a, it's a case of prioritising those. Um, there are some local roads that probably tend to be moving towards arterials in the, in the amount of traffic carried, particularly in outer urban areas where there's uh, high amounts of growth. One way that we can, we can compensate for the, our inability to, um, and, and the impracticality of, of getting infrastructure on, on large lengths of local road is to increase the priority of speed related interventions. And the most obvious among these is, is appropriate speed limits for all roads. Um, the safe system principles are, are still a long way off being applied in their, in, to the extent that they need to be on, on many road lengths, particularly local roads and the high speed local roads in particular. So I think there's a, there's, that should be made a, um, a maximum priority. Intersection treatments at, at key um, locations for um, addressing adjacent and same direction crashes would be very useful and also to promoting the uptake of safer vehicles, which kind of goes together with the, the infrastructure and speed related investment, because particularly newer vehicles, and even since the time that we did this study, features like uh, lane departure warning and lane keep assist uh, are becoming um, much more available in the fleet, and these have the potential with some reasonably um, uh, fundamental road line markings to make a difference in, um, in preventing runoff road crashes in particular. And for the key, the key road lengths and expanded program of barrier treatments, um, including runoff road, addressing runoff road and head off head on crashes would be very useful as well. In the final phase of the project, we aim to determine how future projected and required investment in outer urban road safety could be best targeted at the key road safety issues in order to meet the road, safe, road safety strategy targets. In this phase, we use the MUARC EMETS model to estimate the likely impact of various road safety initiative packages in outer urban areas. The modelling approach operates at a macro level and it includes consideration of a range of initiatives expected to have a sizable and a cost effective impact. And these include intersection improvements, uh, speed reductions in 80 kilometre an hour and 100 kilometre an hour zones, a hypothetical vehicle fleet age reduction. These are the three key areas that we measured. The benefits were measured using the estimated reductions in fatalities and serious injuries.
Now the modeling is obviously quite an involved process, but um, we're just going to cut straight through to the results. The results that we see here are annual fatalities and serious injuries prevented. So these are amounts by which the road toll uh, would reduce in, in, each of the, um, in each of the areas. So provided the, um, the measures are sustained, then these benefits could be expected to be realised or, or maintained every year and, and serve as a permanent reduction on the, on the road toll. Changing all of the current 80 kilometre an hour speed zones to 70 kilometres an hour um, is the first one that was investigated. Now, it's, it's hard to know exactly what sort of a speed reduction you get. The travel speed reduction is not initially at least the full 10 kilometres an hour that you change the speed zone by. You need to back it up with enforcement and of course the higher levels of enforcement and public information and education campaigns will help to improve compliance. But at least in the short term, maybe over the three to five years, you would assume a, a lesser travel speed reduction than what you would expect if the speed, um, if everyone was, was fully compliant. So we modeled three kilometer an hour and five kilometer an hour reductions. And we saw benefits of between 10 and 50 uh, FSI removed for three kilometers an hour and between 15 and 75 for five kilometers an hour. And it's just worth noting too, in, since the time that we did this, um, this analysis, um, Elvik has, has updated the power factors for, um, for um, the benefits of, um, of travel speed reductions. And I think we'd end up with benefits that are closer to the upper end of that um, band now. It'd be a narrower band, probably looking at maybe 30 to 50 FSI and maybe 40 to 75 FSI for five kilometer hour speed reduction um, using the, the, latest, um, the latest power factors from one of Elvik's meta-analyses. Converting all of the current 100 kilometer hour speed zones to 90 kilometers an hour would result in similar benefits. The three kilometer an hour travel speed reduction would yield up to 35 FSI prevented and a five kilometer an hour reduction up to 50 FSI. So combining those two together, the speed reductions, and look, these, these speed reductions are fairly modest. They, they wouldn't have a huge effect, but based on the average travel distance that people um, drive, they're not going to have a huge effect on travel times. Um, overall, you end up saving between 30 and 125 fatalities and serious injuries every single year. And that includes 12 fatalities eliminated simply by rezoning speed limits. Looking now at intersection improvements, we nominated, we, we identified the 15 worst intersections and we, rather than, than, because it's difficult to know, depending on the, the size of the intersection, the traffic flow, the geometry, and so on, rather than trying to prescribe a particular treatment and estimate the effectiveness from that, we, we sort of went more for a, um, we, we went with an estimated 40% effectiveness. So you could regard that as being a target. If you went out there to address those 15 intersections, you would be, you'd say, all right, how, what, what do we have to do to this particular site to achieve 40% reduction? And maybe you do that across the whole 15. So in some intersections, you might not be able to achieve that. In others, you might be able to put roundabouts in and get a 75 to 80% reduction in FSI. So the measures could include roundabouts. They'd obviously be preferential for them um, because of their high effectiveness and, and safe system nature for as many locations as possible. Speed and red light cameras are another option. You could try some innovative intersection treatments, um, even things like local intersection speed limits or other, other um, innovative treatments like a signalised roundabout pairs for freeway and highway junctions. But on the basis of the FSI levels um, observed at those sites and um, combining those with projections in growth for the, the 10 years from the time that we modelled, you could prevent between about 8 and 11 uh, fatalities and serious injuries annually at the current population growth rates. Finally, we looked at reducing the vehicle age. Now this would involve um, turning over the fleet. We include passenger and light commercial vehicles in this uh, modeling exercise. The current fleet average crashworthiness rating is, is about 4.1. This is using the MUARC uh, used car safety ratings, which you can look up for yourself separately, or I can um, send information for that later. If we could convert the entire fleet of passenger and light commercial vehicles to one that was three years newer, we could save 76 fatalities and serious injuries per annum. And that would include probably seven to 10 fatalities as well among that. If we could make the fleet five years newer, it would be 123 deaths and serious injuries annually. Or if we could uh, de-age the fleet by 10 years, the overall average age, 
we'd end up preventing um, up to 215 fatalities and serious injuries annually. And that includes five fatalities for three years, seven fatalities for the five years, and, and 13 fatalities for the 10 year newer. So some significant benefits if, if that could be realized. And obviously it's going to be a, um, an indirect way. We can't just uh, make the fleet newer overnight. It, it need to be result from some um, policies that would serve to, um, to reduce the vehicle age. So these are the key findings of the project overall. Outer urban areas have road safety characteristics that are, in some respects, they're intermediate between those of metro and regional areas. They form a progression between from metro as you move further away from the, the centre of the, of the city. There are some distinct differences, however, relating to high growth in an environment where much of the road infrastructure is potentially a decade or more behind in its development compared with the, the, the level of population and, and housing that's being, um, being built. Speed limits are, are too high in many instances, and there's probably much more of a high dependence on motor vehicles due to a relative lack of public transport and cycling infrastructure, which also dissuades um, active travel uh, for pedestrians. The planned road safety investment at the time seemed well targeted. However, um, attention will need to be paid to timely implementation of that, um, of that road safety, um, to that planned investment and also the setting of appropriate speed limits, which not only applies in outer urban areas, but really across um, every part of the state and indeed the country. Overall, our modelling show there is the potential to eliminate um, of the order of maybe 160 to 260 deaths and serious injuries in total each year. Um, and that's each year and every year, including 20 deaths as well. Um, and, and 20 deaths off a, off a road toll of, of the low 200s is a, is a pretty significant amount. And that all comes from this one um, relatively small geographical region of Melbourne. But it's going to require an achievable package of initiatives and also a strong commitment to implementation and also to, um, to better aligning with safe system principles. Thanks, Karen. I finished a bit early, but that gives us some time for questions. Thank you, David. We have one question so far. Okay, uh, from that's Dave. A, hardly a flood. No, not yet. The flood might come. Uh, the question is from David Healy, and I think I'm going to have to interpret it slightly. David, if I'm wrong, please um, please post again. Uh, so he said older persons were underrepresented, but drivers 65 plus were overrepresented. So I think the underrepresentation he was talking about was in the descriptive analysis, and then in your logistic regression analysis, it actually showed they were overrepresented. Could you explain that, please? Uh, Yes, <laughs> I'm not sure I can, but I think I think it's most likely due to to exposure factors. Um, yeah, I, I I have to think about that in a bit more depth. I hadn't um hadn't I hadn't picked that up from um from um, while I was preparing the presentation. So I think I probably better to get back to David on that one. I think it's possible that the uh, the descriptive analysis obviously doesn't account for any other factors, but your logistic mm. regression model does. So perhaps once they're accounted for the the risk that looked like it was associated with young people has disappeared. But anyway, I'm sure you can look more deeply at your model and, and figure it's, out it's, that. It's, it's probably due to the fact that there probably are much higher levels of uh, much higher numbers of younger people. Um, and so even, even though they're overrepresented, they're overrepresented through number rather than risk, whereas the, the older drivers maybe, and I imagine just thinking about it from a practical viewpoint um, while you were talking there, in the sorts of environments we're looking at, um, there's probably likely to be a lot of high-speed intersections that older drivers um, are, are typically have um, more issues with. Um, and it was also something that I didn't present today, but there's a, a far higher proportion of crashes in, um, in, uh, unst on unstreet lit roads at night than what there are in metro areas. And those sorts of environments with, um, with lower lighting would also present more difficulties to, a, to an older driver as well. It's Trevor here, David. Um, the other possibility might be the older persons might be referring to all road users in the if it's a separate analysis, whereas the drivers 65 plus might be looking at specifically yeah. older older road users as drivers. But we can we can look at that. Yeah, good point, Trevor. All right. So we have a second question from William Gibbons. Could the impact of increased enforcement, mobile speed cameras, and drug testing in particular, also be included in this approach? Yeah, it certainly could. 
we haven't done, um, we didn't model that at the time, but um, there's absolutely no reason why it couldn't be included. Definitely, it's a good suggestion. All right. We have a question from Gavin, which I think might have a slight spelling error in it. So I'm going to re reinterpret this one too. Can you remind us of total FSI for Victoria? He's typed fish, which I understand. Oh. <laughs> Gavin, my, type, my typing is quite, you know, Auto complete like, issues going I'm on. I'm assuming there. that means FSI. If I'm wrong, Gavin, please post again. Yeah, I think we're looking at about, um, well, now um, in the low 200s um, of deaths. And I think it's around 6,000 seriously injured per annum. I think that the definitions change of serious injury over time and serious injury numbers have been um, jumping around a bit, but I think we're, it's, it's sort of six to six and a half thousand annually. All right, and we have another question from RAF. Uh, excellent presentation, David. Can you estimate what the fall in KSI would be if we mandated that the Australian national default speed limit be set to 80 kilometre per hour? For undivided roads that have had minimal road safety treatment, for example, OSREP three star or less roads with no median barriers. And that this is set out in the Australian Road Rules Part 3, Regulation 25, speed limit elsewhere. Mm, thanks, Raf. Uh, it's, it's outside the scope of this presentation, obviously, but, um, but uh, as part of some recent modelling that uh, we've been doing at an Australia wide level, I think you could say that um, I might guess that that would be, there would be a fairly substantial one. Um, um, reductions available there because there's there are um, large lengths um, with no doubt with very high numbers of FSI on 100 kilometer hour undivided roads. Uh, any reduction in speed limit for those, um, and even with um, probably relatively relatively poor compliance compared to metro and inner regional areas, would still gain some benefits because I think a lot of people would comply at least to an extent. You'd get the travel speed down by maybe two or three kilometers an hour, even with a, even if that's all you achieved. A three kilometer an hour reduction in travel speed on on those sorts of roads would give you something of the order of about a 15 percent reduction in fatalities and about a, a 10 percent reduction in serious injury so it would be it would be very beneficial yeah all right so i can see we've got a comment from glenn weir about the fatalities at the moment current lives lost at 203 projected to be 237 this year um and a question from Rachel Carlisle. Roundabouts are safer for vehicles, but less safe for active transport users. Given that growth corridors are a big attractor to young families, should roundabouts be a key priority to improve safety for growth corridors or should a safer multimodal option be prioritised instead? Yeah, that's a very good point, Rachel. Uh, yeah, look, I, everything, everything that you say there is true. I think it would be a, a matter of, um, of having a roundabout program, but looking very carefully at what sort of facilities um, you offer at that roundabout and, and maybe come up with some innovative ways to accommodate um, active transport. It, it's really, I, I think it'd be, it'd be ridiculous to sacrifice all the benefits of a roundabout um, for the sake of, I mean, this sound, sounds really harsh, but for the, for the sake of, um, of, of a smaller proportion of, um, of pedestrians and cyclists. But I think it's really key that um, that we come up with some solutions that can give the benefits of, of the benefits to vehicle occupants of roundabouts, and try and and, and try and eliminate as far as we can the the downsides. Um, there's there's got to be some um, options out there for um for better um better accommodating active travel at roundabout locations. But then having said that, the, the sorts of roundabouts that you might be doing um, may be in areas where um, if, if you're looking at, say, currently 80 kilometre an hour to, to 60 kilometre an hour intersections in outer urban areas, there may not be a lot of active travel because of the road may be, a, um, say, a, a mid-level or low-level arterial. So you may be able to, um, to concentrate the active travel at another location away from the roundabout, whether it be through bike paths or shared, shared by bicycle and pedestrian paths. And, and organise road crossings that are safe, but at, at a separate location. So you can enjoy the benefits of the roundabout without compromising the active travel benefits as well. All right, we have another question from William Gibbons. Could this model be extended to the rest of Victoria to create a total state picture to assist relative resource allocation decisions to maximise FSI reductions for a set expenditure? Hmm. Yeah, yeah, there's no reason why that couldn't be done. Um, the, the way that the, the modelling works at the moment is it simply looks at the effects of countermeasures and estimates um, reductions in death and serious injury 
but with the with, with the availability of um, of costing information, there's um, it, it'd be um, relatively well not straightforward, but it'd be a, it'd be a good exercise to tackle to try and work out some sort of an optimization model that allowed you to put in some constraints for expenditure and relate that expenditure to the to the initiatives that could be rolled out. All right, thank you. Has anybody else got any questions? We seem to. I think I've covered them all. Trevor, would you agree that I've? Yes, you've got them all, Karen. I can't see any any extra ones in the chat. So, all right. Well, if nobody has, has any questions, we are finishing at least ten minutes early, which is uh, well done. So, thank you, David, and thank you everybody for attending today. Hopefully, this will be the first of many. Uh, Monash Insights webinars, and uh, we will keep you informed of future ones. Thank you for your time. Thank you.